Good morning and good evening. Uh, welcome to a special event in our speaker series that we call U.S.-Japan Short Takes. Our program today is titled The Importance of U.S.-Japan Scholarly Exchanges, and we have a panel of outstanding speakers. I am Bruce Aronson, Senior Advisor to the Japan Center at the U.S. Asia Law Institute, NYU School of Law, and also an adjunct professor at the law school. Uh, and I will be the moderator today. And I'm delighted to be here for a number of reasons. Uh, first, U.S. scholarly uh, exchange with Japan is a topic that is very dear to my heart and in which I have engaged in for several decades. Uh, second, today, Japan is more important to the U.S. than ever. Uh, leaving aside uh, cultural soft power, we will not be discussing anime or the new Shogun miniseries today, but the mm -hmm. geopolitical importance of Japan's role as our leading ally in Asia continues to increase. And so does the business financial role, with Japan being the largest foreign investor in the U.S. Uh, earlier this month, there was a conference at NYU's business school on global M&A, and I heard that the Japanese market was the leading topic of conversation in that conference uh, for the first time in over 30 years. And the third reason is I'm greatly looking forward to hearing all the variety of perspectives and views from our very distinguished panel. Uh, I would also like to note that today's topic is broad, but it is an important part of our mission at the U.S. Asia Law Institute, uh, that is to facilitate scholarly exchanges between the U.S. and East Asian countries, with Japan being one of our key partners. I'd like to give just two very quick examples from the wide range of Japan-related scholarly activities uh, that we engage in. Uh, first, in terms of comparative research, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is a symposium uh, on making sense of the Carlos Ghosn case that's on our website. And in that symposium, six comparative law experts wrote essays on criminal justice in Japan and the U.S. Now, this was published in both Japanese and English. And in fact, one of our distinguished panelists today, Seto Miyazawa, uh, kindly wrote the introduction to that symposium. Second, I would like to note, we have an active visiting scholars program and that includes a very innovative agreement with the Japan Federation of Bar Associations. We recently uh, celebrated our 25th anniversary of that agreement. And under that arrangement, every year, one Japanese public interest lawyer recommended by the Bar Association comes to NYU as a visiting scholar at our U.S. Asian Law Institute. Um, people ask me, the two systems are very different. What does a Japanese public interest lawyer study in the U.S.? Well, to give just one recent example, uh, there was an examination of systems in the US for certification and engagement of court translators and interpreters. Um, no such system currently exists in Japan, uh, despite the growing need due to an increase in immigration from Asian countries such as Vietnam. Uh, these are just two examples. Please visit our website to learn more about the range of our programs. Uh, also, you can visit our YouTube channel for videos of our past programs, including the most recent event in our U.S.-Japan Short Take series, uh, which was on regulating AI in Japan and the United States. Uh, I'm sure we'll get new ideas and inspiration from our distinguished speakers at today's panel. And I would like to welcome and briefly introduce the panelists. Uh, Nori Pishikata, Cabinet Secretary for Public Affairs in the Office of the Prime Minister of Japan. Uh, Troy McKenzie, our Dean at the NYU School of Law, who you expect will be joining us today. Setsuo Miyazawa, Professor Emeritus of Kobe University and Senior Affiliated Scholar at the University of California College of Law, San Francisco, and Carolina Vander Mensbrun, Associate Director of the Public Interest Law Center at the NYU School of Law. Uh, I will forego reciting their impressive bios to save time for discussion, uh, but I encourage you to read them on the website. As a very brief introduction to today's topic, as we're all well aware, there is increasing talk of deglobalization, both the geopolitical fragmentation and economically uh, onshoring of supply chains. But I think the need to nurture and develop individuals who can operate effectively across borders is in fact greater than ever, both in the public and private sector. And educational institutions now face a real challenge to maintain an increase cross-border understanding and collaboration uh, in response to this underlying and growing need 
and despite of these recent headwinds and perception. Uh, today, I look forward to our speakers helping us sort out a number of basic questions uh, related to academic collaboration and exchange between the US and Japan and possibly elsewhere. And these would include the importance of such exchange, our goals in conducting such exchange, and the issues and practicalities involved in carrying out some activity. Uh, our program today is 60 minutes. We will respond to as many audience questions as possible within our limited time. So please use the Q&A icon to send us questions. Uh, there will be no opening remarks. Uh, we will immediately begin what I expect will end up being a brisk and free-flowing discussion. And today we will address each other informally. Uh, so let us begin. Uh, first, I would like to turn to Noriyuki Shikata, who will be Nori today, and ask him about the government's role uh, in Japan for supporting uh, exchange. So Nori, aside from all your important postings around the world for Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, you also founded and built the global communications team in the Prime Minister's office in 2010. Although that focused on relations with the international press, people-to-people uh, -people exchanges are also important, and scholarly exchanges are a special kind of people-to-people -people exchange. So why is the government of Japan interested in this area, and how do you support academic exchange? Well, thank you very much, uh, Bruce. Uh, it's a great honor for me uh, to participate uh, in this uh, webinar, hosted by NYU Law School's uh, US Asia Law Institute. And it's great to see uh, that uh, NYU, uh, especially law school, is uh, actively engaged uh, with uh, uh, Japan and the rest of Asia, uh, focusing on the uh, legal arena. So what I wish to respond to you uh, regarding your question is, um, in the context of a U.S.-Japan uh, scholarly exchange, of course, uh, we are committed to deepening our Japan-U.S. alliance. And Prime Minister Kishida is scheduled to visit uh, the United States, uh, state visit uh, next month. And uh, U.S.-Japan relations have uh, expanded not only alliance or security relations, but as you see, trade and investment, culture, education, space, you name it. You know, our relations are so comprehensive and uh, uh, it is uh, vital that we promote educational exchanges in managing our alliance. We have different cultures, and legal systems, and uh, mutual understanding is so important uh, for us. And uh, if you know, we could further promote a two-way educational exchange, that would be conducive to the future of our alliance. And, and I'm not only talking about the US-Japan relations, we are talking about uh, cooperation for free and open Indo-Pacific, covering the uh, Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, and uh, we need to engage Global South to make sure that our international order, free and open international order, is based on the rule of law. So, uh, so in, from this perspective, legal education, is very important uh, to maintain our democracies and also promote the trade and in investments in the context of MNAs and deepening our uh, ties. So I just stop here as my initial uh, reaction. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to immediately turn to Troy and ask him about the role of exchange at NYU Law. Uh, Troy, when you became Dean of the NYU Law School, it already had a long-standing reputation for a wide range of inter international programs. So I'd like to ask, in your view, what are the main international exchange programs, and how do you think they contribute to achieving the goals of the law school? Well, uh, uh, thank you, and and I really am I'm happy to to join this wonderful group for this discussion today. 
Um, as you said, the law school for many years has had um, a deep connection to international, um, the broader international legal community, um, not just because we're in New York City, but because for a long time, NYU welcomed uh, students and scholars from around the world. Starting about 30 years ago, though, uh, we decided to uh, be more, um, how should one say, I think more, uh, more thoughtful and deliberate in building uh, careful exchanges with um, leading faculty members from around the world, uh, scholars, fellows, and students. And the umbrella for for uh, for this was what we call the uh, Hauser Global Law School Program. Now, when the idea of NYU as a global law school was suggested at that time, uh, it was it was unusual. It seemed a little bit um, out of the ordinary. It's not the way that uh, American law schools tended to view their mission. Uh, their mission was to uh, train lawyers to work domestically in courts, uh, in transactions here in the U.S. So this was a bit of a, of a, of a shift. Um, fast forward to today, and it's very clear that the program is not just something that we think of as um, essential here at NYU, but it is also something that happily has been copied by many other schools. This is one of those areas where I think that uh, imitation is a great form of flattery and we want to see uh, these types of programs expand. Um, I, I just wanna highlight a few pieces of what uh, the global initiatives at NYU have meant. One is obviously bringing in uh, wonderful students from around the world and not just to bring them in so that they can be uh, taught separately, take classes separately, but to make sure that they are fully integrated into the intellectual life of, uh, of NYU law. And what that means is that if you are a US student sitting in a classroom on corporations or a classroom on international law or a course on human rights law, or any course really, uh, particularly in the upper level, you will uh, very, 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 very likely uh, be likely to have a student from another part of the world who is in the course with you. So when the professor asks a question and you think uh, from your perspective as a US student what the answer is, you may well hear from a very different perspective. And I'll give just a very brief anecdote. I am an NYU alum as well. And I can remember sitting in my constitutional law class and um, uh, the professor at the time was talking about the ways in which we select uh, judges for our federal courts here in the US, including the Supreme Court of the US, and how independence of the judiciary is fostered by the selection process. And the professor then turned around and recounted a student from another uh, country who would come as, as one of the uh, students in our global initiatives, who had pointed out the ways in which judges were selected in her country. And, uh, and ways in which they were in some ways more independent, less independent. So the professor then brought that into the classroom discussion and it was a, uh, it was a fantastic way of, of stretching one's horizons and perspectives. Um, the other thing that we also uh, take very seriously here is uh, sending some of our students to other sites in other parts of the world so that the exchange really does go uh, in both directions. Um, we have uh, select numbers of uh, global partners where we have um, our current students studying typically for a semester abroad. But then finally, we also have a, a large number of fellows who, who come to NYU for a much shorter period of time, not for an entire year, not necessarily to teach an entire course, but to lecture, to engage in, um, in conversation with other scholars perhaps for a conference and for an extended stay around a conference. All of that is a way of showing uh, to the larger community here and to the community around the world that we share many connections. The differences are ones where uh, in conversation we can think about uh, joint solutions. And we can also learn where there are common issues, common problems, and common solutions uh, that can be 
um, can be discussed in, in that type of setting. Thank you, Trump. Uh, let me turn to Setsuo Miyazawa to ask him about kind of the past and present of economic exchange between the US and Japan. Um, Setsuo, you are well known as uh, our own dean or architect of international scholarly exchange in the field of law uh, between the US and Asia. And you were one of the first Japanese scholars to obtain a PhD in the US and engage in empirical research. You've been a visiting professor at a number of prominent US law schools, including this one, an active arranger of student exchange programs and the founder of the Asian Law and Society Association. So let me ask, what was your motivation for focusing on scholarly exchange so early? And how has the situation changed since you began your efforts? Uh, thank you for invitation uh, to this important webinar. I'm pleased to participate uh, in this webinar, uh, particularly because I had the honor of teaching at NYU uh, as part of the global uh, law school program uh, twice in around 2000. And uh, my activities in the US may be divided uh, into two stages. The first stage is between 1995 to uh, 2002. Law schools like Harvard, University of Washington, Berkeley, NYU, and others uh, started to invite me to teach as a visiting uh, professor uh, every year. And uh, I was convinced that there are many American uh, law and social science students who wanted uh, to learn law and society in Japan and uh, who are receptive to analysis uh, from a Japanese uh, perspective. And uh, I was uh, highly uh, satisfied and uh, some of my uh, students uh, later became scholars and uh, at least one of them now uh, practices uh, in uh, Japan. However, all uh, those law schools already had programs uh, in Japanese law or East Asian law, often with an American full-time uh, faculty member. And my uh, teaching uh, was based on one-shot invitations. And on the other hand, there was no Japanese legal scholar who was teaching at an American law school on a regular basis at that time. And uh, there were also uh, many uh, American law schools without any uh, courses on Japanese law. So I thought that uh, I should obtain a stable position at an American law school with uh, no course on Japanese law. So however, my quest for such an opportunity was uh, interrupted uh, for five years for my uh, engagement uh, in the founding and operation of a new law school. So the second stage of my activities uh, in the United States started in 2008 when I became a visiting professor with a long-term contract at the UC Hastings in San Francisco, uh, which is now called the UC Law San Francisco. And uh, it may be surprising probably that uh, Stanford was the only law school on the West Coast uh, with a regular faculty member in Japanese law at that time. So I thought San Francisco was a natural place to establish a program on Japanese law. So I, of course, I greatly uh, uh, liked teaching students. Uh, my uh, interest changed from uh, education to uh, uh, scholarly uh, contributions. So uh, scholarly uh, contributions became my uh, main motivation in the second stage. So uh, I organized symposiums on Japanese law every fall uh, between 2012 and 2019 and in 2023 and the papers were published in American law journals. And Bruce was, of course, one of the uh, uh, contributors. Uh, you uh, wrote an excellent paper about uh, corporate governance uh, in Japan. So I believe those uh, papers have enriched the English language literature on Japanese law. I also worked to establish academic associations to provide lasting forums where scholars in Japanese or Asian law can get together exchange ideas and support their uh, activities in their respective uh, institutions. I co-founded the Collaborative uh, Research Network on East Asian Law uh, in the Law and Society Association, the section on East Asian Law in the Association of American Law Schools, and the Asian Law and Society uh, Association. 
And then I retired from UC Law San Francisco last fall. And the question is whether there will be any other Japanese legal uh, scholars uh, who are willing to engage in similar activities uh, in, the inter in the United States. And uh, Shigenori Matsui, a great constitutional law scholar, is a full professor at the University of uh, British Columbia. But uh, no one is like him in the uh, uh, US. I know that Berkeley and the University of Illinois have short summer courses taught by uh, vis uh, Japanese visiting faculty. Still, they do not, uh, they do not have a position uh, to make a of scholarly and institutional impacts in the uh, United States. However, uh, I probably need not worry much about the lack of Japanese legal scholars who proactively seek opportunities to uh, directly contribute to the uh, scholarly exchange in legal studies between Japan and the United States. Because several American law schools, including NYU, have American uh, faculty members uh, who play central roles uh, in that uh, regard. Then are there any possibilities to make Japanese legal scholars and practitioners more actively engaged in intellectual exchanges between Japan and the United States? That is a question posed by Mr. Shikata. And uh, I'd like to discuss it later because I have already spoken too much. Thank you. Thank you, Tetsu. I'd like to turn to Carolina and ask her about her own personal experience with exchanges. Uh, Carolina, you have been on both sides of scholarly exchange as a law student in the US. You went to Japan for a semester of study. Uh, you worked in Japan at Amnesty International, uh, where you created educational materials on human rights targeting secondary schools and universities. You've taught uh, at an international human rights clinic at Fordham Law School, where you worked on a project involving criminal justice reform in Japan. So what, what did you make of all this? What did you learn about the challenges and benefits of cross-border scholarly exchange from those experiences? Well, thank you so much, Bruce, for inviting me to speak on this panel and um, just have to share my wholehearted enthusiasm for cross-cultural exchange and what it's done for my professional career and how it's enriched my life. And actually, I want, I want to briefly note that prior to law school even, when I was in college, I engaged in um, a President Eisenhower People to People program, which had U.S. American high school students interact with Japanese high school and college students. And I think those early experiences of exchange and the value and how we can learn, um, learn from our global community really were formative for me. Um, so in terms of my own experience studying at Waseda Law School in Japan, um, as a human rights practitioner, as my background in a public interest lawyer, I really think as, as we become more interconnected through globalization, and I know some of the other speakers address this, there are increasing number of global problems that the world needs to address collectively, whether that be environmental issues, regulating environmental um, and climate change, the regulation of artificial intelligence, security, cross-culture, cross-border corporate matters. So I think that does really necessitate having attorneys, young legal minds that are fluid in cross-cultural exchange, different legal jurisdictions, thinking about the way different countries might regulate and address different matters. And that cross-cultural exchange at Waseda really um, was a formative and hands-on experience of learning how um, the Japanese legal system addresses um, different civil, criminal, um, and international law issues distinct from the United States. So it was really interesting to take courses with Japanese faculty and learn about um, constitutional rights issues, pressing legal matters um, in a Japanese context, and come at it and have conversation with Japanese students and faculty members. Um, and you know, in my exchange program, we also had students who were also from Canada and various countries in Europe. So, you know, maybe more students from the global south would also be wonderful too, but it was really um, a global exchange of ideas and thoughts that was really rewarding. Um, it also provided me an opportunity to engage in my own intellectual research pursuits while I was in Japan. So I had a really wonderful number of supportive faculty members that facilitated field work and hands-on experience that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. 
So in, in terms of the intellectual opportunities for young legal minds going abroad, whether that's Japanese students coming to the U.S. or vice versa, I do think um, the wealth of research that can be learned is really, really wonderful. Um, and also through the clinical experiences and the courses that we taught, we had an opportunity to also create projects where we were taking U.S. procedural reform approaches um, to the criminal justice system and the way notices were, were functioning um, in, in the context of um, capital punishment and presented our ideas and findings to the Ministry of Justice and Department of Corrections in Tokyo and had a really robust dialogue. But I think you know, that need, the ability to learn from one another, um, you know, and, and what benefits that might might create in our global legal community really uh, were very rewarding. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, everyone had their opening, they weren't really opening remarks, but their chance to talk. And so uh, I would invite the panelists to jump in at any time from now on um, to keep things going. I, I would like to return to Nori for a second and ask him, what are his views on the impetus for all these, uh, the need for these exchanges? Um, so Nori, what factors would you emphasize uh, as sort of creating the need for study abroad and other educational exchange? I mean, on the public side, um, perhaps we need more globally oriented policies and to counter rising geopolitical tensions. And on the private side, um, there's increasing internationalization of Japanese businesses. So we need more internationally oriented Japanese businessmen generally, and that means lawyers as well. Um, so what do you think is important in kind of creating this need uh, for international cooperation and exchange? Uh, Bruce, thank you. Um, personally, I was uh, uh, studying abroad in the United States uh, three times. Uh, as a high school uh, student, exchange student, as a senior, uh, in high school in Missouri, or Missouri, as they call it. And um, I was a graduate student in, uh, at Harvard, and I did the sabbatical at, at Harvard again. And uh, those uh, opportunities uh, really broadened uh, my uh, views and horizons. And I was very much impre impressed by Ka Carolina's uh, story about her time at Waseda and uh, uh, it's great to learn uh, that uh, uh, Japanese universities can provide uh, that kind of uh, educational uh, opportunities. So as uh, Carolina said, we are confronting a common agenda, climate change, terrorism, data issues, uh, challenge of AI, and uh, we need to come up with better global governance and this is this needs to be based on more developed international law and uh, so what we need to tackle is uh, how we could come up with a global rulemaking to address emerging challenges facing the government and also business community so uh, legal education in the United States, uh, NYU Law School, has been renounced uh, for international law and uh, issues including like human rights issues. We need to deepen our understanding how we could support other countries in the global south to protect human rights and to share you know, our understanding of uh, international law. So this is a joint work and the, the basis for such um, work is uh, from uh, international educational exchange and hopefully from uh, younger days. So if um, any of the students listening or uh, watching you know, this webinar become interested in studying abroad, going to say Japanese law school, which have started international uh, exchange programs. I, I hope you know, that some of those, the, the uh, audience uh, would become interested in those opportunities. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I, I can't resist asking Troy uh, about his trip to Asia last fall. Uh, I think it was your first trip, at least as Dean, to go to Asia, including Japan. And um, you must have had a number of impressions, both general and also more specifically with respect to NYU law, including prospects for scholarly exchange. Uh, will you please share your impressions from your trip? Well, it was a wonderful trip. It was actually not just my first time in Asia as Dean. It was my first time uh, in East Asia ever. So for me, it was uh, it was a whirlwind experience. Um, and in particular, as, uh, as someone who uh, had always uh, wanted to go to Japan, that uh, introduction to, uh, to Japan, to Tokyo as a city uh, in particular was extraordinary. I really, really enjoyed the trip. And while I was there, I had uh, many meetings over the course of, of just a few days um, uh, including uh, the ability to interact with some of our alumni. Uh, the Washington Square Club of Japan is an active and uh, boisterous group of, of NYU alumni, uh, many of whom um, uh, have uh, or uh, Japanese uh, students who studied at NYU law at some point in the past and then went back to Japan, but also uh, American NYU law students who have ended up uh, living and, and working in Japan. I think briefly what I took away from, from, uh, from that experience, both in my informal interactions with people and in the more formal interactions is to, to just build on what was said earlier, there is tremendous hunger for person-to-person uh, -person scholarly exchange and tremendous hunger to do joint work on pressing problems, uh, problems where there may be an international law solution or problems where we don't know what the solution is, but there may be a, a common system or a common uh, governance regime that can help us uh, work towards some type of solution. Uh, I, I appreciated having those types of informal interactions because as I would speak to someone who you know, might be an NYU alum who is currently working um, uh, at a law firm, but has uh, a real passion about solving uh, problems of climate change or uh, human rights issues, it became clear to me that these are not isolated and uh, parochial concerns. These are really concerns that all of us have and that all of us have uh, an interest in working together uh, to, to resolve. But seeing that, understanding that, understanding that on an intellectual level is one thing, but seeing it in, in uh, on a human level I think made a, um, a tremendous uh, impression. So I, I, um, I enjoyed my first trip and it will not be my last trip. Uh, I very much want to, uh, to go back uh, because I learned so much and, and found it very enriching. We would certainly encourage you to go back as often as you can. Um, uh, please, I again encourage the audience to send it, share with us your uh, impressions and send questions on the Q&A function. And meanwhile, I would like to turn back to Setsuo. Uh, Setsuo, I asked you before sort of what happened in the past and up to now. And I'd like to ask you this time about sort of the present and the future. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenges to scholarly international exchange today? Um, and do you have any thoughts about how to address these challenges? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for asking that uh, question. And uh, Mr. Shikata's uh, presentation at the preparatory meeting a few days ago uh, made me think about uh, the uh, current challenge to uh, uh, increase uh, intellectual exchanges between uh, Japan and the United States and the rest of the world uh, in legal studies. But before uh, presenting it, uh, I'd like to outline what uh, I think about the current situation of U.S.-Japan exchanges at four levels from uh, my perspective. The first level is law students. There's an, in, an increasing imbalance. American law students coming to Japan are rising, while Japanese law students going to the US are declining. Uh, for instance, Waseda Law School has exchanged for agreements with 10 American uh, law schools. And uh, every year, Waseda can send one student to an American law school for one year particularly to study in the LLM program. 
while an American law school can send two students for uh, one semester. In 2022, five Wasada students went to the US, while 14 American students came to Wasada. And in 2023, two Wasada students went to the United States, while 19 students came from the United States. And this year, no Wasada student is going to the uh, United States. Problem is the Japanese bar examination. Uh, law students can now take the bar exam surprisingly in the middle of their second year. And they cannot waste time to taking a, a study abroad program before passing bar examination. So this situation in Japan will not change until the bar exam uh, is uh, changed. On the other hand, uh, the market for American law students who understand the basics of Japanese law will expand. Uh, this is uh, because Japan's most rapidly expanding law firm category is Tokyo offices of major American law firms. And then the second level is young lawyers. The imbalance will be the opposite. Young Japanese lawyers in the business law area particularly will uh, continue to go to the American law schools to obtain an LLM and to take by examination. On the other hand, uh, there's no uh, 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 merit for young American uh, lawyers to come to Japan as law students because they can immediately join Tokyo offices of American law firms. The only problem uh, is probably for young public interest lawyers in Japan who want to learn American practice rather than getting and passing the bar, getting a law degree and passing the bar exam. Probably the visiting scholar programs better fit uh, suit them. And the third level is young scholars. By tradition of the jurisprudence in Japan, most young legal scholars are virtually required to spend a year or two as a, uh, at a foreign law school, but they do so for their own research and they cannot yet be expected to contribute to uh, scholarly uh, exchanges. So the situation may be similar to young American uh, scholars in Japanese law. And finally, the fourth level, this is the uh, uh, main issue uh, for uh, uh, this uh, topic. And the fourth level is to establish, uh, is for uh, established legal scholars and practitioners who can present their perspectives uh, to the host countries communities of scholars, practitioners, and policymakers. Mr. Shikata presented an ambitious idea to uh, create a scholarly exchange uh, system that is broader and higher than the existing one, existing ones. The Fulbright program in Japan, which is partly funded by the Japanese government, has greatly contributed to uh, uh, scholarly uh, exchange between Japan and uh, United States. I'm sorry. Uh, particularly uh, for, uh, for young scholars, uh, visiting uh, uh, scholars uh, and uh, visiting uh, uh, professors. However, the number of recipients in law has been very small. And uh, it would be nice if the Japanese government uh, could create a new program, particularly in law, particularly for public interest lawyers and international lawyers who want to learn practice rather than uh, pass the uh, bar exam in their respective areas uh, in the US. However, a far more challenging issue is creating a, a program to exchange established scholars and practitioners who can present their perspectives in the host country's relevant communities. Such a program should be able to attract and send appropriate scholars and practitioners to the target uh, countries for a semester or two. While such a program should also be able to attract and invite appropriate scholars and practitioners from the target countries uh, for a semester or two. Uh, for instance, uh, they may be requested to uh, teach, required to teach a class every week, in addition to giving a monthly public seminar, uh, for instance. Uh, of course, such a program must honor the independence of those scholars and practitioners, and it should not require them to uh, represent any specific government positions. However, 
we can expect that uh, their perspectives will inevitably reflect the scholarship and practice of their uh, respective uh, countries. I think we can uh, trust them. So the Japanese government has a, uh, now the Japanese government has a legal development program for Asian countries with a nascent uh, legal uh, system. But uh, this new program should be established separately because the purpose and the targets are different. And I sincerely hope the Japanese government will uh, be able to establish such a program uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to Carolina at least one more time and then get to a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so Carolina asked about your exchange experience and now I'd like to ask about your work experience. Um, in your current position at NYU's Public Interest Law Center, uh, you focus specifically on career counseling for students in the area of international public law and human rights. Um, are NYU law students generally interested in interning or working in international organizations and also in countries other than their home country? Um, do they often ask you for advice about having an international career in law? Uh, and do you feel you have enough or many options to share with them? Thank you. Um, that's a great question. So I work with both JD and LLM students, and I work with students from six continents um, from all over the world. And there are a large number of students who are really interested in practicing international public interest law or gaining and or gaining experience doing public interest legal work abroad. And so sort of the bespoke one-on-one -on -one counseling services I offer is getting to know a little bit about the student, um, whether they have existing experience in a country abroad that they want to build off of, or if they want to gain new experience in a jurisdiction or a country around the world. And in terms of the support that NYU offers students that want to gain international law experience, it is quite robust. So I generally work with other institutes within NYU, including the US Asia Law Institute and the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice um, to connect students with different NGOs, intergovernmental agencies, sometimes government agencies all around the world that would welcome that foreign cross-border exchange. Um, and we offer at NYU a number of stipends that enable or facilitate students to carry out internships abroad or postgraduate fellowships. So I would work with a student in learning the areas of law they want to practice in, the communities they want to work with, and brainstorm together what organizations in which country or countries around the world would be a good match and kind of help them um, reach out, connect them with those organizations. Um, but depending on the country, uh, we would have less or more existing connections. So part of my job is also being a bridge between countries and communities and fostering um, exchange and developing ties so that we can link our students to contribute to the missions of those IOs or NGOs um, wherever. Great, thank you. I'd like to turn to a number of questions from the audience. Um, a couple of questions focus on uh, are there any specific areas of law that particularly benefit from exchange programs? Um, can anyone be more specific? Um, that's a little bit of a diff difficult question because um, I think there are many areas uh, where we have had people come and do comparative international research. And I don't know if I can uh, single out a, a particular one. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? So so, Bruce, uh, I, I, I actually want to um, amplify what you just said. I've been surprised over the years in realizing how many areas uh, benefit from uh, from exchange, uh, not just if you're a comparative law scholar, but uh, if you have an interest in how uh, real problems get solved in different parts of the world. And I'll give a very brief example. I would have assumed that outside of the uh, international tax treaty realm, there really wasn't much to learn about uh, uh, taxation other than looking at the U.S. tax code. And uh, about 10 years ago, we had a visiting scholar from uh, from another country who came to NYU and, and at a lunch conversation, he began explaining how uh, individual uh, consumers in, uh, in his home country, individual filers, 
uh, work with the tax system. And it completely shifted my view of something rather small but important, which is how do individual taxpayers interact with our um, inter uh, um, in the Internal um, Revenue Service. And that was, it's a very small thing. Um, he then gave his explanation for the thinking in that country about that important question of, of tax collection, which is both practical and legal. Um, so in an area that I would have th uh, thought, really, there's not much to, to learn, uh, there is something quite, um, uh, quite interesting to learn. I do think from the perspective of areas uh, that I teach and, and have taught over the years, uh, one can learn, for example, um, whether it's litigation or whether it's in one of the other fields that I cover, uh, bankruptcy, um, an understanding of common problems, whether problems of, say, mass resolution of claims, which is what I study, uh, that is a problem that um, many, many different uh, legal systems face with, with different um, precursors and different assumptions. Um, and having a, a scholarly exchange about ways of, of thinking through uh, resolution to those problems can be quite uh, helpful. Um, I'll close by saying, obviously, in, in areas that are international in legal scope, international law, uh, international human rights law, uh, it's natural to want to think broadly and across borders. But I wouldn't I wouldn't limit um, the focus to those areas. Just recently, we had one program on constitutional law, which I thought was very interesting and would not have been the first area that comes to mind in terms of scholarly exchange. Um, and uh, I gave one example previously uh, in my opening remarks. Um, we see people from many different areas. Um, anyone else or should we go on to the next question? Yeah, I agree that uh, any, any uh, uh, areas can benefit from uh, uh, international uh, uh, contacts, international exchanges. Uh, if uh, the uh, uh, scholar or practitioner uh, really wants to learn you know, something uh, that doesn't exist in their respective uh, country or that is uh, providing uh, a foreign legal system that is providing uh, some innovative uh, solution to the uh, problem uh, the person has. Uh, so uh, I think any uh, areas uh, uh, can benefit from uh, international uh, exchanges. Lori, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I'll just mention a few areas uh, from a, a kind of a public uh, sector's uh, perspective. You know, number one is uh, in, in public international law. And uh, there, there are many, many areas, uh, including the United Nations, WTO, human rights law, that need to be addressed. And uh, so uh, for us, you know, in order to improve our global governance, public international law is uh, so important. And uh, the, there is a number two, uh, business-related uh, uh, transactions, legal transactions, obviously. And as uh, more and more Japanese and uh, American companies are working together, in the context of joint ventures, it is uh, essential that uh, we have lawyers talking to each other to come up with successful uh, transactions or agreements. And of course, uh, this relates to the issues of uh, engaging with the third parties, uh, including in the context of uh, uh, the trade law. Of course, uh, Japan has been promoting uh, TPP or by the administration has been promoting IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, including a supply chain uh, agreement. So as we are coming up with new supply chain, for example, on semiconductor, uh, the, these also require uh, legal support. And number three is uh, somewhat uh, closely related, maybe unique to uh, Japanese uh, uh, circumstances. As you know, anime or manga are very famous across the world, but uh, we are seeing uh, so many cases of uh, uh, violation of intellectual property rights or plagiarism. And uh, these re also require 
uh, global uh, protection uh, from a legal uh, perspective. So I just mentioned some of the, those uh, uh, examples, uh, cases, uh, which are of our interest uh, from uh, uh, the, the kind of government point of view. And, and just very briefly on uh, regarding the proposal from uh, Professor Miyazawa, uh, I think it's great if we could uh, come up with some uh, financial incentives uh, for legal students uh, to uh, study in each country, promoting uh, uh, US Japan uh, legal uh, educational exchange. And uh, I guess there could be a role for governments, but also business uh, companies could support uh, those exchanges. Thank you. Caroline, anything to add? Or should we move on? I think we can move on. Everyone covered, Great. covered it. Thank you. Um, so we have a, a few questions um, relating to kind of the public side versus the private side. Uh, one question is, what do law firms think about all this and how are they involved and what, do, what are their expectations? And then on the public side, we've already had a brief discussion that there's less activity, I suppose, on the public side, maybe greater need. Um, it's... Um, I will, as a personal comment, I will say the needs are all over the place. And I always tell at least American students uh, that Japan has a wonderful legal market, but for the wrong reasons. The wrong reasons being there's a lack of people who are effective um, in cross-border work compared, even compared to surrounding countries like Korea and China. Um, so does anyone have any thoughts on what are the interests of role of law firms on the private side and what they can contribute or else what more can we do on the public side? Um, and and uh, an additional question following up on Setso's comment was, if we have an imbalance of study abroad exchange, um, can we do anything uh, other than money to encourage students in Japan, for example, to come and study in the US while they're in law school? So well, that's a, an amalgam of three different questions, uh, but anything that strikes any of the panelists, we'd love to hear from them. I think uh, law firms uh, should uh, tell uh, law students that there's a growing market for uh, lawyers uh, who have studied about the foreign legal system. And uh, that is obvious for Japanese business lawyers uh, who wants to work on cross-border uh, legal work. And uh, I think Japanese bars, as in general, uh, uh, tends to uh, uh, give a too pessimistic view about uh, the future of uh, legal market. But actually, I think uh, those uh, largest uh, business law firms in Japan, as well as uh, Tokyo uh, branches of American or British law firms, are expanding. And so uh, those law firms should bring that uh, news to uh, American students, particularly. And uh, this, that, uh, and also, uh, I think Japanese business, uh, young Japanese business lawyers know that uh, uh, their career development will depend on uh, education uh, in the uh, United States. So, uh, uh, although the number may be declining right now, uh, uh, after passing by exam, I think uh, 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 they will start uh, thinking about coming uh, to American uh, law schools. So uh, I think there was a question uh, from uh, Dan Rosen about uh, you know, reluctance of young Japanese uh, uh, law students to uh, go to the uh, United States. And uh, I think uh, his episode uh, uh, represent uh, the bias of uh, uh, you know, senior faculty members uh, in Japanese uh, universities uh, about uh, foreign legal uh, studies. And, in spite of the fact that uh, they spent few years uh, uh, in uh, uh, abroad when uh, they were young. But fortunately these days, I think female students are more uh, becoming uh, willing and interested uh, in studying uh, abroad. So uh, they, uh, more female students are working uh, toward uh, uh, graduate degrees. And I think uh, in that sense, I'm not too pessimistic about uh, the future of uh, international exchange at the level of young lawyers and young scholars. Um, 
How about on the public interest side? Uh, as I mentioned before, we have an agreement with the Japan Federation of Bar Associations. Um, to give another example of a recent um, person who participated in that program, someone came to NYU and studied family law and divorce, uh, because in Japan, it's very easy to get a consensual divorce and very difficult to get a non-consensual divorce. And that person is now a Bar Association Research Fellow in the Philippines, where due to their Catholic tradition, there was basically still no divorce. Um, so is it a question of setting up new programs or, or being more deliberate and promoting the programs that we currently have? Uh, I will mention that last year, for the first time in 25 years, we did not get a public interest law attorney uh, from Japan. Uh, and this past December, uh, I went to Tokyo, and at my suggestion, we had a, a, an event to further publicize uh, this program to Japanese lawyers. Um, so how about the public side? Do we need to do more with what we have, or do we need new programs or some combination? Yeah, as I said, I think public interest lawyers in Japan, uh, increasingly more public interest lawyers in Japan want to learn uh, practices uh, in the uh, United States in their respective uh, fields. Uh, there are, for instance, uh, lawyers uh, who actually interned uh, in uh, public interest uh, law firms uh, in the uh, uh, United States or public uh, defender offices uh, 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 in the United States. So uh, the problem is to provide financial assistance to those people. And the Japan Federation of Bar Associations provide a small stipend to those who want to participate in the exchange program uh, established by the uh, Japan Federation of Bar Associations with uh, some uh, American law schools, including uh, NYU. So uh, I think uh, what is needed most uh, is to establish uh, some program uh, to uh, encourage them to uh, study in the United States. And the international law applies uh, to this uh, problem. I mean, public international law. Thank you. As we were chatting before the program formally started, and Nori reminded us uh, that the yen is at an all-time low, at least since 1990. Um, and that's good for Japanese exports of goods, but not so good for Japanese exports of students and scholars who uh, find the new cost in the U.S. and their, and their cheap yen uh, <clears throat> something of an obstacle. Well, we've, we've reached our time of um, one hour. Uh, I would like to give uh, our panelists uh, a chance, uh, if they choose to do so, to make some final comments or observation uh, on our discussion today and um, you know, what we should think about going forward. We've certainly identified uh, both very substantial needs for exchange and, and benefits, um, including some individual experience uh, from some of the panelists. Uh, and, and we've also just noted some of the increasing costs involved. Um, any final thoughts on where we should, what we should be doing now, where we should go from here? Nori, please. Well, thank you uh, very much uh, <clears throat> for this uh, webinar. Um, I noticed that uh, there are a number of questions uh, that were a bit unanswered, and sorry, you know, because of this uh, time limitation. But uh, uh, given uh, the interest of uh, New York uh, environment, I use uh, law schools uh, interest in uh, engaging with uh, Asia, particularly Japan, with the Dean's visit uh, to Japan. I hope uh, that we'll be able to establish, for example, joint degree program with a counterpart uh, a Japanese uh, law school. And of course, you know, there are structural issues surrounding the uh, Japanese uh, bar exam systems. And uh, I guess, you know, we need to uh, be attentive uh, to uh, improving uh, this kind of uh, systemic uh, issues. Uh, but the last uh, thing I wish to comment is uh, for American uh, legal uh, law students or uh, lawyers, uh, for example, who are interested in coming to Japan, uh, there are increasing opportunities for, for foreign lawyers uh, in Japan. And uh, of course, uh, for example, Tokyo has great food and uh, the English education is getting better. 
And uh, uh, so for J Japanese uh, legal students, law, law students, if they acquire uh, the, the experiences in American legal education, they will expand you know, their career horizons. So as we promote uh, this exchange, uh, I'm sure that you know, there will be lots of uh, productive results uh, that we can expect. Thank you. Thank you. Just yesterday, I received an email from an American lawyer uh, who works in Tokyo with an American firm. I'm going to be in New York next month. Can you send my contact information to any interested NYU law students? I'd love to meet them. Um, we have, in fact, a very uh, well-organized system of uh, having law students meet law firms. Uh, but the, I think the underlying interest is still certainly there. Um, anyone else with some final thoughts? I just wanted to close with uh, here, here, uh, everything that Nori said, I agree with. <laughs> thank you. Well, in that, in that case, our, our time actually ended three minutes ago. So I'd like to thank uh, the panelists for a very interesting discussion and the audience for your participation. I think it's given us a lot of food for thought and we will immediately go back and take a look at all the things we're doing with Japan and what other things we could be doing. Uh, which I, I suppose is the key takeaway from our talk today. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Good night. Goodbye. Bye.